The Spirit of the Lord is upon us, and He has anointed us to preach the gospel and to raise up a body of believers to be the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, a church without walls. Our goals are to teach the Word of God so that at any time you can see the Word, hear the Word, and understand the Word of God. You can be converted into that Word you see, hear, and understand. And once we are converted, we can now strengthen the brethren and as witnesses declare with boldness, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. I often get asked the question of, um, uh, of why Christians should care about or think about um, Black History Month. I actually get asked it uh, a across the board. I've had African American friends ask me that. I've also had uh, my, my white brothers and sisters ask me. And yet, uh, although I think that it needs to go beyond a single month, there is a special point of emphasis in the month of February to consider the numerous and significant contributions of African Americans in particular uh, to American culture. And, and I, wanna, I, I wanna encourage you in this way. That, that there is no kind of Western Christianity uh, without what God accomplished in Northern Africa in the first century. In fact, uh, a great deal of our kind of theological understanding and makeup was wrought in Northern Africa, not in Europe. In fact, there, there are many that would even trace the Reformation itself to Martin Luther's relationship with a deacon uh, in Northern Africa. And so our, our roots as Christians and our roots as America and the things that we would look around uh, and, and really celebrate, a, a lot of this has been built uh, by those who are African American or African descent or, and, and so it's wise for us to grow in an understanding and a knowledge of how God has used and called unto himself men and women from every tribe, tongue, and nation on earth, and how those men and women have contributed uh, to this beautiful tapestry uh, of, of what it means to be the people of God in the United States of America. And so February uh, is a month that has been set aside for that. Uh, my, my hope would be that your curiosity might be stoked in February so that you become a lifelong learner uh, about how God is using men and women, both historically and in the present, uh, to shape the kingdom of God in front of us. And so uh, I would just encourage you, use the month of February, branch out, identify an African-American in history that you don't know anything about uh, or that, that you didn't hear growing up in the public schools and, and dive in. I, I would commend to you, I think one of the best places to start uh, is Wilkerson's book, The Warmth of Other Sons, about the Great Migration. I think that book, uh, specifically for my Anglo brothers and sisters, uh, lays a bit of a foundation, some historical foundation, that I think helps, maybe helps uh, understand kind of the current landscape in a way that, that for many of us, uh, a, a, it's been hard for us to understand. And so I, I would just commend that resource as just one. Uh, and I think from there, you, you'll be able to spot some other ones to, to jump off on. So uh, dive in, God bless you. Let's grow together as a family. History shapes humanity. Humanity has shaped history one way or another. Everybody has been shaped by both. Every single one of the 7.5 billion people on the planet are in some small or big way affected by certain factors such as gender, age, place of birth, heritage, and yes, even skin color. All these factors are experienced at times as either a burden or blessing, or sometimes both. Is Black History Month in television, cultural institutions, media, and why not in the house of God? We pay attention to the events and experiences that matter. We want to pay tribute and celebrate what it means to be a black person today and throughout history. We're still learning. We're still listening. History is still being shaped. We're 
witnessing a move of God. That's not just happening in the states, but it's happening in the world. And what we're seeing is God, he is turning the page on racism. He's turning the page on prejudice. He's turning the page on these things that we've had to deal with for 400 years. You know, I was driving to church Sunday morning and I uh, begin to start weeping when I started thinking about what's going on and asking God for his heart concerning this hour. And I mean, I wept for over an hour as I was headed to church because I was getting touch with the heart of God. And what I discovered is we're living in a day and time where the veil is being lifted off the eyes of, you know, the Caucasian world who has been so insensitive to what's been happening. And even in the church, you know, Martin Luther King made the statement, I've only had two regrets in life. One of the regrets was that the church did not do anything. The church did not say anything. The church was silent. And he, he was only concerned. He says, I was not concerned about the Ku Klux Klan. I wasn't concerned about those that hated us. But what concerned me, what I felt like was a failure in my life, or not that he failed, was that the church didn't speak up. And now we're in a place that, I mean, the church is realizing, I'm talking about the, the Caucasian church is realizing for once and for all, what's been going on in the Black Lives community has been wrong. But here's what they're coming to. They're saying to God, there's a repentance that's, that's sweeping the land. And repentance is, God, how could we be connected to you and not know that this was this mattered in your heart? Can you imagine walking with God, lifting your hands in worship, and you don't even have the heart of God concerning humanity. If you think about what Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, he says, pray our Father. We only have one Father on the planet. He is the Father of all human race. When John lifted up his eyes and he saw heaven, he saw every ethnic group before the throne room of God. There's nothing wrong with your color. There's nothing wrong with this. But we've had this systematic uh, racism going on and now it's being overturned. God is overturning everything and it's causing his church to get back in touch with his heart. And I'm telling you, we're living in the greatest time. It will be harvest time because we're tearing down every walls of division, all walls of segregation, all walls of prejudice, all walls of racism are being torn down. We're, and this will be the greatest time that the church has ever had for harvest time. Woo, glory! From our V store, T-shirts, hats, accessories, and more for men, women, and children. Visit vcmi.org/shop.
Welcome to Victory Christian Ministries International, a place where the Word of God and the power of God are available for you, with Apostles Tony and Cynthia Brazelton. At this time, we want to take the time as a church and as a people of God to talk to you. And we want to pray for what's happening in our country today. You know, Pastor Tony and I, you know, we, we posted something that's, you know, in our hearts for our church and for the people of God all over the world, and specifically all over the United States, things that are happening right now. Um, our hearts are going out, and, and, and we have a part to play. Everybody has a part to play, you know, whether you're protesting or, or whatever you're doing. But what we need to be doing as a church, and that is praying the will of God into this atmosphere and into the world. And so, you know, in James 2 and 9, it says, But when you show prejudice, you commit sin, and you violate the law, the royal law of love. And truly, the law of love has been violated too many times in our country. The hatred and the injustice that have been taken, that have taken place simply because of the color of someone's skin. This is very demonic. You need to know it's demonic. And that demonic preju prejudice and racist spirit has one thing in mind, and that is to rob men and women of their dignity, their identity, and ultimately to destroy their lives. You know, in John 10 and 10 in the Passion Bible, it says a thief has only one thing in mind, and he wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you will give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until it overflows. God wants every one of us to experience his love and his goodness and show it through one another, a life that overflows in abundance through knowing him. You know, our hearts really grieve with those who have lost loved ones and those that have been victim to this demonic spirit and these demonic attacks that are happening right now. We continue to pray and join with everyone for those, for the, all of this to stop. It has to come to an end. And so we speak into the atmosphere and we pull down the strongholds of this demonic spirit that is plaguing our society and we as a people must be aware of this demonic spirit so that we ourselves don't become prey to it, to this spirit of hatred. Our position is that of love. You know, it says in James chapter 2, verse 8, that your calling is to fulfill the royal law. This royal law has been violated, but we are called to fulfill the royal law of love. And that is, in the scripture it says that we must love our neighbor as you love and value yourself. For this is keeping the law, and in in this keeping this law is a noble way for God. He is calling all of us to live. And so we know there's a lot of demonic activity that is happening, but what you don't want to do is again become prey to it. That you don't start hating and, and that you don't stop being that you start being prejudiced against people because of the color of their skin but that we love and value one another. It has to start with the church. It has to start with us. And use the power and the authority that God has given us in his word so that we can pull down the strongholds of the enemy and walk in the freedom that God has called every human being to walk in and to experience. And so again, our hearts and our, our thoughts they grieve and they break for those who have lost loved ones and become victims of these this crimes of hatred. And so we continue to pray the peace of God over our country and that we will be a people that can live in peace and harmony in and with one another. Praise the Lord. Amen. You know, I, I was thinking about this time that we're in and uh, where we're dealing with racism and and. I thought it a need to define some of these things so that we'd understand what we're dealing with because this is nothing new. It it it, it happened in, in the Bible during Jesus' time, during the, the apostles' time. But when we think about the word racism, it's it means hatred or an intolerance of another race. Can you believe that? That there is an intolerance of another race. And I believe the issue 
if we're going to solve this issue, cannot be solved by um, dealing with the, the fruit of it. We've got to get to the root of the problem. You know, they're talking about, you know, that these, these, these groups of people are, that are motivating it to go in a wrong direction. And, and so now we're turning our focus to that group. But it wouldn't exist if there wasn't any racism at all. So they wouldn't have the power to turn something in a bad direction, which is something positive. But so when you think about this idea of racism, it's the idea that one's own race is superior and that they have a right to rule over another race. The idea that, you, that your race is superior, we, we get the idea of bias and discrimination, segregation, unfairness, and, and partiality comes out of that. That's why we, are, we experience uh, those things. When segregation is a result of racism. Discrimination, result of racism. Unfairness partiality and you know that God treats everyone the same <laughs> he's not partial at all now here's the problem that I think that we we need to understand uh, uh, let me just say this um, you know we've got to define our humanity by our faith and not our faith in terms of our humanity I'm going to say that again We've got to define our humanity, our color, our culture, by our faith, and not our faith in terms of our color and our culture. Are you hearing me? In other words, we can't say, I'm a black Christian, I'm a white Christian, I'm a Latino Christian. That, that means then that we're using the adjective of being black to describe a noun. And so, so all of a sudden, Christianity is a noun and being black is an adjective and an adjective describes. And so we're walking in Christianity trying to describe Christianity from our culture, from the color of our skin. We're, we're trying to describe Christianity from being white and how we were brought up, how our mothers and our fathers and our great, great, great grandparents taught us. We're trying to hold on to those things, but that's not how you describe Christianity. Because if you look at Christianity, you will discover that, you, that many of us, that your, your grandmother, your, your great-grandfather, your, your great-great-great-grandfather, and your great-great-great-great-great-grandfather was wrong. We were created in the image and the likeness of God. Do you understand? Christianity is an adjective. See, we don't deny that we're black, we're white, we're, we're, we're whatever nationality we are. But Christianity is what shapes the culture. Oh, glory to God. When we define the word being prejudiced, it's an unfavorable opinion or feeling formed beforehand or without knowledge or thought or reason. When we think about it, it means to dislike. It means to misjudge. We can look at a color of a skin and misjudge it, dislike it. And the problem of it, it, it stems because the solution, it must start in the church because the answer to it has got to start with the church. It's got to start with the reality of what Christianity is in the mind and heart of God. It's a problem that was dealt with in the Bible. Here is Jesus. He meets a woman in John chapter 4. He goes to Samaria. Listen, God knows that this is in the world, that we're, we're dealing in a society that has fallen, and they're, they're dealing with all of these issues and, and their feelings and their emotions, this wrong teaching. Even in the church, the problem is the church hasn't spoken up. We've been quiet about it because, honestly, we believe that. We believe that our, our race is superior than another race. And we need to stand up and, 
and here is Jesus. He meets a woman at the well, and the woman of the well, he asks her for a drink of water. And I love how the scripture said, and the, all the disciples were gone. None of them was there but Jesus. Because Jews don't talk to Sumerians. And then the woman makes that statement. She says, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me for something to drink? <laughs> she, because she said, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And so Jesus didn't deny that. He didn't, even, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't deny the fact that he was a Jew. And she didn't deny that she was a Samaritan. And for many of us, I don't know, even in the black culture, sometimes we want to deny that we are, we are black because we feel shame. We feel put down. We don't feel valued. We've spent decades of trying to be accepted by looking like another group. But I want you to notice there was no shame in who you are. There's no problem. Jesus didn't deny it. And so they continue this conversation, and Jesus offers her water and says, if you drink of the water that I give you, you don't have to drink anymore. She said, well, give me that water to drink. And, and then Jesus turned the story and says, hey, you know, start talking about, you know, you've been married, and, and the man that you're with <laughs> is not your husband. And all of a sudden, she, she begins to ask a question that draws Jesus' attention. She said, you know, we as Samaritans, we worship here in this mountain. But you Jews, you worship. Here's the problem. It's in the church. You worship in Jerusalem. Look at that. Separate, but one father. And Jesus said, wait a minute, I'm going to have to talk to you about this. Now, it was all right when you pointed out that I was a Jew and you were a Samaritan. But when you bring my father in, I've got to bring clarity. Come on, man. Who glory to God. And I think that's what... And he said to her in verse 21, he says, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither go on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worshiping the Father. He said, you worship what you do not know. Can you see the problem? How in the world can we be worshipers and don't know God? How is it possible for us to have racism ruling and things like prejudice ruling our heart when we are worshipers of God? He said, you worship what you don't, you don't know God. So let me, let me help you out here. He said, you worship what you do not know. He says, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. He says, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. See, he's not seeking uh, for you to bow down and, and worship him. He's just seeking worshipers. You need to get that. He's seeking worshipers, not people to worship. I, I, I'm looking for worshipers. He says, why? For God is a spirit. Here it is. And those who worship him must worship him how? in spirit and in truth. And that's been the problem. We, 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 we have not worshiped God in spirit and truth. This problem came up with, with you know, the apostles. We, we read about Peter in the book of Acts and well, how... I want to just say something, you know, in that story, that same story with this woman at the well, you know, when Jesus' disciples did come back from going to buy him something to eat, and they marveled that they saw Jesus even speaking to this woman. So we can see that they had some prejudice within themselves as well that was been handed down to them. Like, Jesus, why are you talking to her? And, you know, they could have been saying that for a lot of reasons. One, because they knew the occupation that she carried. But more importantly, that they knew that she was a Samaritan. And so he's like, Jesus, why are you talking to them? They, that was in their hearts, but they didn't even say anything. And I think when it comes to prejudice and racism, you have to deal with the hearts of people. You know, there are people that are around you that may not say anything. They may not do anything, but it's in their heart. And, you know, God wants to deal with the hearts of people. And God began to use the same woman to go and tell the people in the city to come to Jesus. And so God wants to use us 
to t bring people to the Lord, not separate ourselves from one another, not think of ourselves better than we do of others, not put a, a race of people down because of the color of their skin, but that we will value everyone because everyone is valuable in the kingdom of heaven and everyone has been called to purpose and that is to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our commission. That is our mission from God is to bring others. If I think that I'm more valuable than you, if I'm better than you, then I won't speak to you. I won't talk to you about the Lord. If I think that I'm inferior to you, and I won't talk to you about the Lord. But God has given us this commission, this mission to bring men and women to the Lord Jesus Christ. So she goes into the city and she says, hey, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. Is not he the Messiah? And they came, they followed her because there was something about her that allowed them to see that there was something different about her encounter with God. And so they came to, this, to see Jesus and obviously they heard the word for themselves and said, we now believe first because of your testimony, because you're, and just imagine her being a woman at that. I believe God had a whole lot of things that he wanted to share to the church concerning this service because, you know, not only did they put people down because of their nationality, but they put them down because of their uh, gender as well. But they got used a woman to go to the men and say, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. And they followed this woman and they said, now we believe because of your testimony but now we believe because we heard him for ourselves. And so it's so important that you begin to deal with your own heart. Again, don't allow yourself to become prey to the hatred and the racism and the prejudice that is by this demonic spirit that will get on your life because of the way you have may have been treated. Is that's when we got to push past that prejudice and that racist spirit and operate in the love of God. And go throughout the city and say, come see a man. Hallelujah. So you can see there was discrimination yes. even against women. Um, segregation, unfairness where they were concerned, but, but not where God was concerned. He, he never denied that he was a, a Jew. You should never deny who you are or feel ashamed or less than or inferior because of who you are. God never made her feel bad about being a Samaritan. Mm -hmm. And being a Samaritan, who the Bible says Jews had no dealing with, and being a woman, she goes out and preaches the gospel. We have places of worship today where women can't do certain things, still today. And, and I, so it, we just have to realize that when we see things like partiality, and, and bias and, and, and things like that, unfairness, you know, that's not our father. That's not God. He loves us all the same. You know, when you think about the, the apostle Peter, when he was in, he was sent to Cornelius' house to preach the gospel for the first time. You know, God had to deal with him because, again, they had no dealings, not only with the Sumerians, which were really half Jews. Yeah. I, I think they were conquered by the Syrians, and they had, had ended up um, marrying the Syrians, and they produced what we call um, Sumerian. And so the, the full-fledged Jews didn't want to have anything to do with them because they were half-breeds. And God, notice what he did. He, he, I, I must come by here because he needed to correct all of that. Now, here's Peter, the Gentiles, and, and, and the Jews. The Jews had nothing to deal with the Gentiles. And so while he's upstairs sleeping, waiting for dinner to be cooked, God gives him a vision. And, and I love what it says. Uh, it, it says, uh, it says, uh, he says, and, mm, he said, then he became hungry and, and he wanted to eat. While they were making ready, he fell into a trance and he saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet, sheet bound at four corners descending to him and let down on the earth. And in it were all kinds of four-footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And the voice came to him saying, arise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord. Notice who he's talking to. 
for I have never eaten anything common and unclean. Oh, glory. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Now, this was done three times, and then this thing was taken up. Now, here's what God is saying to Peter. See, Peter, God is causing Peter to go take the gospel message to the Gentile, but, it, but it's cultural differences and his bias and prejudice and his racism didn't allow him to associate with the Gentiles. And so God visited him in a trance and says, don't say what I say is cleansed is unclean. Now, we know the story. Peter goes to the Cornelius' house. He preaches the gospel to them, and they get filled with the Holy Ghost and begin to speak with other tongues, and he's blown away by them. Peter has changed, and so we find Peter in Galatians chapter 2. You know, even before that, you know, Peter got a revelation in that time. He said he, he perceived now that God has no respect of person, that God doesn't love one race of people more than he does another race of people. That God loves all people. He has no respect of person. And we have got to be come to a place where we have no respect of persons. That God doesn't see men as unclean or uncommon. Because Jesus' blood cleansed them all and gave them that right place and that right standing. Been reconciled back unto God. And so God wants us to see all men be reconciled again back unto God. And so we can't have respect of our persons or think that one race is superior or that think that other races are inferior to one another. Can't be, have respect of persons. You think about now, Peter is absolutely changed yes. to the point that he begins to go and eat with the Gentiles. You know, Peter's eating food he never ate before, you know, because <laughs> he couldn't eat that before. He's, he's, he's in, the, in, in their homes. So now he's eating stuff that God says don't call it unclean. So he's eating with them. And then other Jews come down and catch Peter doing it. So the Bible says in, in, in Galatians that Peter got up out from the midst of the people of the Gentiles because other Jews came down and saw him doing that and left them because he did not want to have the backlash of doing something that went against traditional law. It went against being what, what they were operating in. He didn't want to take a stand. And that's why I'm saying the church has to stand up. We've got to go against the traditions of our fathers. And, I, I, you know, maybe your father taught you some things that shouldn't have been taught. I was told by a wonderful man of mine, he says, you know, if my father who is in the grave now knew that I was working for black people. He would turn up over out of the grave. Do you understand? We, they were taught some things that, 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 that were not right. And, and, and these people went to church, read their Bibles. But we're finding it happened here in Peter's day. Peter had an encounter with God. God told him, don't say nothing. It's common, which I've called unclean, that I've called. I said, it's, I call it clean. Don't say it's not clean. And yet here they are still responding to the culture. The culture comes, and all of a sudden, Peter begins to act like he never heard from Jesus. And then all of a sudden, there creates this contention between Peter and Paul, when Paul came down and saw that, he bought correction. Come on now. Look at the church. I love what it says. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. Before the people came from James, he would eat with certain Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were who are of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas, and Barnabas wasn't even a Jew, <laughs> was carried away with their hypocrisy. This is what Peter's saying. And then he says, but when I saw 
that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, come on, Paul. If you being a Jew live in the manner of a Gentile and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as a Jew? Who we are Jews by name and not sinners by Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith in Jesus and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Do, do you understand what Peter did? Peter dealt with, I mean, Jesus, I mean, Paul dealt with Peter. It was wrong. The church dealt with it, its error. And I believe that the way, the solution to the problem, it, it must start in the church. We cannot be silent on this issue. We cannot be quiet on this issue. We are all the sons and daughters of God. We are like 1 John 4, 17 declares that as Jesus is, so are we in this world. We're like Jesus. There's not multiple degrees of Jesus. There's not a superior Jesus and an inferior Jesus. There's, there's not a, a Jesus that's favorable and unfavorable. There's not a Jesus that, that is dislike and alike. Or it's just Jesus. And I love it when, when, when Paul, Saul at the time, was persecuting the church in Acts chapter 9. Jesus steps in the scene and says, Saul. Why do you persecute thy me? He didn't say why you persecute the church. Because Jesus sees the church and himself as one. There's no difference between any believer in Jesus. Whoa, glory. What you have done to the least of them, God says, you have done it unto me. We've got to realize the color of our skin, our culture, our background, really doesn't define who we are. Our Christianity, our faith in Jesus Christ, and his finished work is what defines who we are. Well, glory! As he is, so are we in this world. Until the church begins to step up and declare that's wrong, that's not right, we will continue to see racism. We will continue to see bias and discrimination and segregation and unfairness. We will continue to see partiality. We will continue to deal with prejudice against ethnic groups until we rise up. Now, like how the Bible says, there's neither Greek, Jew, Male or female, bond or free, but we're all what? One in Christ Jesus. That's what God is after, unity and oneness. You know, you can be one and be different. We're not, oneness doesn't mean we like the same things, you know. You might like country music. You might like jazz. That's okay. You can be one and like the music you like. But what we've got to realize is that we're not divided. We're not separate. We are all one in Jesus Christ as he is. How? So are we in Jesus Christ. And then Paul goes on to finish that with a scripture that we use so many times. He says, I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live how? By the faith of Jesus Christ. How do we live in the flesh? By the faith of Jesus Christ. Why? Paul said, I was crucified. Nevertheless, I live. This will, this will bring, this will get rid of all of this. And the life that I now live in the flesh, whoa, glory, I don't live in racism, I don't live bias. I don't live discriminating, segregation. I don't live with prejudice. I don't live. I live how? By the faith or the faithfulness of Jesus Christ who died for me. 
Who glory. We see Jesus in the example with the woman in the well. He didn't deny his race. He only spoke up when that girl brought his father into the picture. Wait a minute, baby. You worship what you don't know. Let me tell you. This thing is spiritual. And those that worship me must worship me. How? In the spirit and in truth. When we begin to operate from the spirit and in the truth, everything going to be all right. You know, in John chapter 16, it talks about why Jesus came. John 16, verse 13, and I'm going to get out the way. John 16, verse 13. Pull it up, Pastor Brazen. Um, John 16, verse 13. Oh, no servant can serve two masters. Uh, you, want, you want me 16, 13? Is that it? it says, but when the spirit of truth comes, yeah. he will lead you into all truth. He will not speak of his own words, but he will speak only what he hears and will tell you what will happen in the future. The spirit of truth will bring glory to me by telling you what he receives from me and all that the father has is mine. And that is why I said that the spirit will tell you what he receives from me. Yeah, I was looking at Luke. I was like, that was not looking good. <laughs> I, I love that. That was John I was looking at. Yeah. Um, again, notice what it says in John 16, verse 13. It says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, comes. Notice what happens. He will what? Guide you. We're, we're supposed to be guided by him. We're not guided by what our, our forefathers taught us that was wrong. And it's obvious that when we look at the history of the church, there was some wrong guidance there. Because even in the church, they, they believed in slavery. And they taught people out of the Bible where it was concerning slavery, that it was okay. But notice, when the spirit of truth has come, he'll do what? Guide you into all truth. And, and that's what we've got to realize. We need truth because truth sets men free. Truth doesn't make people a slave. Truth, people doesn't treat people as some inferior object, something less than who God made them to be, which was we were made in his image and likeness. And so when the spirit of truth has come, he'll do what? Guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of himself, but he will speak what he hears. And that's what he will tell us. And he will tell us things to come. And he will glorify me. So when we, when we let him lead us, it brings glory to God. For he will take what is mine and he will declare it unto you. And all things that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said unto you, he will take what is mine and he will declare it to you. Praise God. Let's just, you know, those that are here and those of you that are watching, wherever you are, can you stand to your feet with us? Let's just go to the Lord God in prayer. It is our desire, you know, to pray for those that have lost loved ones during this time, whether it's because of the rioting that's taking place or because of COVID-19 or coronavirus. And let's pray for those that have been victim to any of sickness or disease or this act of prejudice or or racism. That is not the will of God. It is a demonic attack upon our country, a demonic attack upon humanity itself. And that is not the will of God. God is no respect of persons. God, Jesus Christ died for every single one of us. And it was his blood that was shed for humanity, not any one race of people, but his blood was shed for every single person, for all of humanity. And so let's lift up the people of God. Father, we're so grateful, so thankful for the word of God. Thank you for grabbing our attention this morning to the plan and the purposes of God for humanity and your will for our lives. 
We thank you, Lord God, that there is no division among us, that we're not separate from you, Lord God. We've been reconciled back to you. So, God, we lift up your people before you, Lord God. And first of God, we pray a hedge of protection around about your people. We appropriate the blood of Jesus over our lives, Lord God, and over these United States of America. God, we plead the blood of your Son and the comfort and the peace of the Holy Spirit upon those that have lost loved ones to racism or prejudice or to the COVID-19, Lord God. And Father, we lift them up before you. We speak your peace and your comfort of the Holy Spirit. Rest mightily upon them right now in the name of Jesus. And God, we thank you, Lord God, that your blood protects those that may have been victims to the COVID-19 or victims, Lord God, to prejudice and racism. Every one of us have experienced it in some kind of way where somebody have put us down because they thought that we were less or less valuable. But God, you said in your word that we are not to look at ourselves from just a human point of view in terms of stand natural standards of value. But you said, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. The old man have passed away and all things have become new. And we thank you that God, all things are of you who have reconciled us back unto you, God. And you have given us a ministry of reconciliation to tell others to come back into the fold of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we thank you this morning, and we use and exercise the authority that you have given us in the Word of God. We pull down every demonic stronghold, every attack of the enemy. We pull down prejudice. We pull down racism. God, we pull down sickness and disease of any kind in the name of Jesus, and we saturate the atmosphere with the blood of Jesus in the words of our mouths, and we command you, devil, enough's enough. Stop! In the name of Jesus, we rebuke you, Lord. The Lord God rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And God, we thank you, Lord God. As the people of God gather together to protest and come against the strongholds of the enemy, even if they don't know it's a stronghold of the enemy, they are protesting, they are marching against injustice. God, I pray a hedge of protection around about the protesters, that you would keep them, Lord God, under your protection, under your care, Lord God. Father, we thank you for peace that will be upon them, peace in every city where they're protesting, peace in the name of Jesus. God, we declare there will be no loss of life in the name of Jesus. We take authority over that spirit of murder in the name of Jesus. God, you said the enemy, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But God, you've already sent your son Jesus who have come to give us life and life more abundantly. So God, we speak the life of God into our cities. We speak the life of God into the people of God that they will come up, rise up, every sleep giant in the church rise up in the name of Jesus and God we thank you that we're bringing souls into the kingdom of heaven Lord God that you would equip us Lord God with a unique anointing to know how to minister to every race of people to every human being that we come in contact with that we would lift up the name of Jesus God you said if you be lifted up you draw all men unto you. Lord God, we lift you up in the midst of a, COVID, a virus. We lift you up in the midst of a pandemic. We lift you up in the midst of racism and prejudice, Lord God. We lift you up, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. We lift you up and we thank you, Lord God, that you're drawing men. You're drawing men. Drawing men unto you. Lord God, we thank you that it's a time not only reset within the church, but you're resetting every country, Lord God. You're resetting every people, Lord God. You're turning the hearts of people back unto the Lord our God. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. We turn our hearts to you. Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, reveal truth to your people, Lord God, so that we can walk in light of this glorious gospel. And show the love of God that you have given to every single one of us so we can walk in light of it. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. The enemy is under our feet in the name of Jesus. And we declare victory belongs to us. Victory is ours in the name of Jesus. So yes, Lord God, we sing we are glad this morning. And we're glad this morning we know the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know who we are and whose we are. So we walk in our identity, Lord Jesus. We will not allow the enemy to rob us 
of who we are and who you called, what you've called us to do because of the race of our, because of our race or the color of our skin. We thank you. We've been called by you, Lord God, handpicked by God himself. And so we thank you, Lord God, that we'll do the things that you've created and called us to do. In the mighty name of Jesus, come on and give God some praise. Come on, let's just pray in the spirit for a minute. Have your way, Holy Ghost. I want to read this. Hallelujah. And then I'm going to pray for you in the audience. Thank you, Lord Jesus. The Bible says, for as many as that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. When the Bible speaks of sonship, it speaks of maturity. He says, for they are the, the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage. We didn't receive the spirit of bondage, racism and discrimination and segregation, uh, prejudice. We did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. Fear is what's been perpetuating all of this. I'm afraid of something that I don't understand. It's, it's a generally a practice to be afraid of something that you don't understand. I don't understand the, the, their culture. I don't understand the color of their skin. So I am afraid you develop biases and unfair opinions. But God said, I have not given you a spirit of bondage to that. Woo. Glory. Rabbi Shataya. But you have received the spirit of adoption. I thank you. By whom we cry, Abba, Father. It says, the Spirit himself bear witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. And if deed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. I love how God always associates us with him together. He says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time is not worthy to be, be, to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Hallelujah. You know, it's amazing that we qualify for the supernatural when there is suffering in this age. Do you understand? The supernatural is necessary when problems show up. But the key to all of that is that if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Hallelujah. Somebody shout oneness. oneness. That's what God wants us to be one with him. We don't have to deny the color of your skin. We don't have to deny your culture, your background. None of it is bad. And it's nothing wrong for you to pursue your, your culture to get them born again and save. And it's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with it because the noun is <clears throat> our color, but the adjective is Christianity. It defines all of us, no matter what background, no matter what color skin, no matter what we have or don't have. We are defined by Christianity as he is. So are we in this world. Listen to me, you that are watching us by broadcast. We don't want you to get caught up and miss out. We don't want you to have operate outside of your union, your oneness with God. We don't want you to be immature. Maturity rests in the reality of what Jesus declares over your life. Do you understand? We were defined way before this problem showed up. We were defined way before we got here. God knew you before you were ever formed in your mother's womb and called you out for this generation. God's called you to the, the greatest manifestation the world has ever seen. The greatest outpouring, the greatest glory will be seen in your life. When we realize 
that we're not defined by the color of our sin. We're not defined by what we have or don't have. We're defined by who our daddy is. Woo! We are sons and daughters of God. We're heir to his kingdom. And we bring heavenly realities. We bring the possibilities of heaven to the earth. You will not be defeated by this. You will not be terrorized by it. As a matter of fact, all of these things come from humanity and it's fallen ideology and it's under our feet. We know that Satan is behind all of these things and he's been defeated. Woo, glory! We will rise up above it and be in union with God. We overcome evil with good. Hallelujah. We will not allow hatred to form in our hearts. We will not allow separation and segregation and division to form because of the color of our skin, because we're all one in Christ Jesus. But we will recognize where the source of this is, and we have taken authority over it. Maybe you have allowed it to get in your heart. And I'm saying to you, and I'm confronting you the way Paul confronted Peter. That's not the message of the gospel. That's not how we roll. Well, glory. We have a Holy Ghost that leads us and guides us in all truth. And I'm preaching truth to you this morning. Why? Because when truth is released, freedom comes. We want a world that's free. Martin Luther King said, free at last. Thank all my almighty. Free at last. God is the only one that can bring freedom and liberty. And it's when we stay in alignment with his spirit, stay in alignment with his word, having his mind and heart concerning humanity. Whoa, glory! Will we see what God sees and treat people the way that God treats them? We're all sons and daughters of God. We are all his children and he is our father. We are born of his spirit. Now I want to pray for you. I know you want to fight. You want to holler about this stuff. Yes, it's injustice. And we thank God for the, 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 the speaking out of it. We appreciate the marching concerning it. We applaud it. We're behind it. Now the church needs to say something about it. Whoa, glory! We cannot be silent about this thing. Because I believe as goes the church, so goes the society. And so we're speaking against it. It's wrong. We all have the same father. We are heirs and joint heirs. So let me pray with you here. Maybe you tune in and you don't know the God that we're talking about. Maybe this seems foolish to you. And that's because the things of God are foolishness to a man who doesn't know God. Remember, God comes from a world where there's none of these things. But there's only possibilities, and he's offering that to you this morning. And I want to pray with you that you would open your heart and accept this Jesus Christ in there. Let him come in there just the way you've opened your heart and allowed all things to get in there. Let God get in there. I want to pray for you. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I want you into my heart today. I want you in my life today. I believe that you came to this planet. You died for all of our sins and you was raised from the dead and you're alive forevermore. Woo, glory. I'm asking you. I received Jesus this morning as the Lord and Savior of my life. I denounce hatred. I denounce racism. I denounce prejudice, bias, unfair opinions. I recognize it doesn't come from God. I recognize Jesus loves the whole world and I make the quality decision to be like him. If you're here this morning and you, you have walked away from your Lord and you want to reconnect, be plugged once again back into your relationship, say, Lord, 
I repent. Forgive me. I want to come home. I open my heart once again to you. I receive you as my Lord and Savior in Jesus' name. Listen, as soon as you prayed that, it happened for you. Now, there is a gift of the Holy Spirit that gives you a language from another world. Yes, we have a foreign language. <laughs> it's called the baptism of the Holy Ghost will give you a foreign language. He'll give you the language of the Spirit. And if you would lift up your hands and open your heart, God will fill you with this foreign language. Father, you see those who have lifted their hands before you. I'm praying that the Holy Ghost will come right where they're at and fill them with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of praying in the Spirit. In the name of Jesus, I speak to somebody who is having a heart condition. You're struggling with something going on in your heart. I declare over your heart the healing power of God. I release glory, glory into those airways. I command health and healing to all your flesh. Glory, I release it now in the name of Jesus. I come against arthritis. I come against tumors. I come against even a doctor's report that has spoken against your body. And I declare in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it will not be so. I declare live and arise. And be healed in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And last but not least, I speak to those who, if you want to be in partnership with us, partnership with Tony and Cynthia Brazelton, then I want you to um, go to our website, connect with us, um, and let us know that, hey, I want to become a partner. I want to, I want to get in on the game. I want what's on your life to be on my life. I want to participate because I know that you know, virtual church is real now. We have partners all around the country who cannot necessarily come to a building. But you can partner with us by the, through the airways, through this virtual connection. And so I pray for you this morning. Father, I lift up everyone before you. And Father, I thank you. The best is yet to come. That these are the days of the greater works. And I prophesy greater works will come from your life. Woo, glory. You will not die without fulfilling the prayers that you've been asking for. I pray for your family, your children, your loved ones, your co-workers, those that you love, your friends, that you've been believing God, the community that you're part of. God has given you that community. And I prophesy that community will come in because of what God has given you that these are the best days of your life, that you will rule and reign in it, in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. Now, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May he give you perfect peace, nothing lacking and nothing missing in your life, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. There's some things that are going to be happening on the website as you're closing out. Thank you so much for being a part of the service today. Listen, we have our part to play. Whether you are one of the protesters, we're praying a hedge of protection around about you. Make sure every one of you vote. Vote in people that will put a stop to racism in our country. Make sure you do your part and support those that desire to stop all of this. This is our part in it. And as you continue to pray to pull down the strongholds of the enemy, in the mighty name of Jesus, have a blessed day. We love you so much. God bless you.